now we're uh, pleased to have Roxanne grew up in this congregation, has traveled a journey uh, that I'm pleased to say she's been faithful. And uh, her bio is in there. I don't know if you need it or not. It's in your bulletin. Uh, but I knew her since she was a little girl. She had dark little curls come down. Uh, can picture her like she was yesterday. Uh, of course, that tells you how old I am then. But just come, I want a prayer for you. God, thank you for the journey that you've led Roxanne and Mike and their family on. I thank you what you've done in their lives. And I thank you for your spirit already moving here in the service. And I pray that you will continue to flow and move uh, and fill our hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Trying not to cry. <laughs> it was moving. Um, um, I guess I better hold that mic. Because I do like to walk. <laughs> Um, God gave me a, now it's on, sorry, God gave me a dream years and years ago to write a book, and I didn't believe that I could write a book, let alone write a message, um, but as you can see, I hold that book here. And, you know, when I walked into the church and I saw some of the changes, I was like, wow, I really like this, your wall in the back, where it says God uses ordinary people to carry out his extraordinary plans. God has a plan for each one of you that is sitting out here today, those that are online listening. You may feel that you can't accomplish anything. You may feel you're just ordinary and there's nothing special about you. But God can take that and he can use that and do extraordinary things through you and touch and change people's lives. Um, this book has a picture on it of a ring of keys. You know, anything about me, I'm really big on the keys. I love keys. I collect keys. Um, and so when God chose the cover, it did not surprise me. Um, many of you here know me from little. And um, so many of you know when my mom passed away. And it was a very traumatic moment. And right after we um, buried my mom, we were on a cruise boat. We, and while I was on the cruise boat, I encountered God. And I had a vision of him handing me a ring of keys. And that is... The reason for the cover of the book, I don't share in the book about the cover, um, but I wanted to share that because this is home. Um, this is home. You know, some of you know my journey and you know um, some of the difficulties I've had with my mom and the painful time it was. And for God to hand me a ring of keys. And at that moment, I knew I was called into the ministry. And so I began pursuing, chasing, running 
after God. I talk about running in my book. Um, and so when I saw this sign here on Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Every time I run, I quote that scripture. And moving to Harrisonburg, Virginia, I run up quite a few mountains. Nothing like here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I run up them, sometimes walk up them, sometimes feel like I'm crawling up those mountains. Um, so yes, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Um, you can even stand up here and speak. I'm so proud to hear that Jenny and Dale are stepping into that role. And I just pray God's blessing over you as you guys become the voice um, that God will use and speak through you. I'm real, real excited. I'm anxious to hear. Come back and hear you guys preach. That, that is really awesome. God takes ordinary people and do extraordinary things. I had asked Jenny what you guys have been studying, and even Pat had told me when she had reached out um, that you were going through a series of repentance. And I was like, oh, I talk about repentance. I talk about sin in my book. Um, so I just want to build on that. Um, the title of my message is Transformed. There's a chapter in the book called Transformed. But when you go through a time of repentance, every time we find ourselves in need of repenting, it should always be followed by a time of transformation. Otherwise, the repentance won't, it won't last. You know, you sin. And then you feel that guilt and that shame and that remorse. And then you feel that separation from God and the weight of it gets heavy. And then you repent. And then life goes along just fine. And then you reach out because you've been tempted to sin and you sin again. And you feel that guilt and that shame and that remorse and that regret and the separation from God. And it, the weight gets heavier. And then you repent. There needs to be a time of transformation. If you don't, you keep like a hamster wheel. It spins round and around and around. And that is what it's like with sin and repentance. If there isn't a time of transformation. Because that separation from God is an awful feeling. It really, really is. We need to choose to jump off, see if I can jump off in heels, that hamster will, and allow God to transform us. If we don't, and we don't change, and we keep doing the same thing that we've always done, we're going to get the same results. If we don't. I'm going to be honest, we're going to end up like the world. The world is so confused right now. It doesn't even know what sin is. And I'm not one to listen to a whole lot of news, but news has a way of getting back to me. People don't even know who they are. They're questioning their identity. I have also seen many Christians walk away 
walk away from God, walk away from the church because of sin, because of us too as the church. And I talk about the church at large when I refer to the church. Shame on us when somebody walks away. Shame on us for not walking alongside of them, not loving them, not forgiving them, not guiding them back and just being there for them. We are the church and we are called to represent God and represent God well. You know, in the world, the world is crying out, crying out for the church to rise up, for anybody to rise up and tell them to give them hope. God can use ordinary people to do extraordinary things in this world and to reach this lost and dying world. It's time. It's time for the church to take a stand. The church has allowed sin to seep in through its cracks. That sin no longer looks black and white, but gray. And I really like what Pat had said to me earlier this week as we were talking. She said to me, the church decides each day what type of gray they're going to be. And that's the truth. I have connections all over the world and the church has changed. It is time for the church to rise up and repent. And you may be sitting here and you may be saying to yourself, oh, but we haven't done anything. I don't have anything to repent of. Hmm. I was convicted this week and I have to say, woe to us, woe to me. Monday, Monday, I'm in Kroger's parking lot with my daughter, Sarah. I ministered to the homeless for seven years on the streets. I've went to Baltimore and ministered to them. So in the Kroger's parking lot, now we had already seen a homeless lady in the Coles parking lot. But in the Kroger's parking lot, God got his message across. But to be honest, I didn't listen to it. There was a lady under a tree with a small child. The child was about the size of Judah my grandson, who is three. When Sarah and I were leaving the parking lot, I saw them when we came in, but when we were leaving, my window was down and our eyes locked. And she takes her hands in the form of a prayer and she begins to beg me, please help, please help. Please help. Let me tell you. Sarah kept on driving and I did nothing. I did nothing. One, I was trained to never give money to the homeless because you don't know what they're going to spend it on. But I had something 
greater than money because money wasn't going to fix her problem. The $40 I had in my purse wasn't going to change her life and set her on a new path. But what I had inside of me would have changed her destiny. Believe me, God convicted my heart. And I realized that since I had stopped ministering on the streets, my heart kind of hardened a little. And so there was a time of repentance that I needed to go through. But with a time of repentance must come a time of transformation. And I want you to understand, I, I went and I, I had to search, what is repentance? What really is it, Lord? Um, and I found this. And I want to share this with you. Because I understand this. Repentance throughout the Bible is a summons to a personal and absolute surrender to God. In repenting, one makes a complete change of direction. So if sin is here and I'm walking down the path of sin and I'm repenting, then I need to make a 180 degree turn and pursue God. My eyes need to become fixed on Jesus. Not my past, not the sin, but on Jesus. We need to get to a place of complete surrender by putting ourselves in the hand of God. Allowing him to literally mold and shape and cut away anything that is not of him. We need to be transformed into his likeness. In his complete likeness. He lives inside of us. So if we're going to be transformed into his likeness. In Genesis 1, it's where it all began. How do we become cre transformed into his likeness? So we go back to the beginning, the back to the very beginning, the foundation of our earth. Then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air and over the livestock, and over the entire earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man, and he created him in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. We guys are created in the image of the almighty God. We are like God. We have his character, we have his emotions, we have his nature, we have his heart, his very breath, guys, lives inside of you. When he created you, we, were, we are the only part of creation that he created with not just his spoken word. All of creation, he used his word to speak. But when it came to us, he used his word, he molded and shaped us out of the dirt, and he literally breathed his very breath into us. When God told us to rule over the earth, he really wasn't talking about us ruling over each other, not at all. He was talking about the animals. He gave us authority and he gave us power there on that garden. 
he gave to Adam and Eve. And you know the story. You know the story of fall of man and how when they reached out and they, I tend to seem to think, now this is just me thinking, my brain, that Eve was tempted over a period of time to sin. And then when she realized, oh, I could be like God, not even realizing that she was already like God, reaches out and takes that fruit or vegetable. It was on a tree, so I assume it was a fruit. And she took it and she ate. Now, I could be wrong, but I tend to believe that when she handed it to Adam, Adam knew what he was eating. Now, I could be wrong. It's just my imagination. And I believe in that in moment when he ate that fruit, because see, God told Adam in Genesis not to eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But you know what? Eve wasn't created yet. So Eve would have heard that command secondhand. But the moment that Adam was the one that ate of that tree, he literally took the keys to the, and hand them to Satan. He literally handed them over here. Because you know that Jesus had to come and Jesus had to get those keys back. It was the only way. God had to banish Adam and Eve from the garden. There was no other way. If they would have ate of that knowledge of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil before there was a redemption plan, before they were saved, not of that tree, the tree of life, sorry. If they would have went and ate from the tree that they were allowed, the tree of life, they would have been bound in their sin. There would have been no hope of a redemption plan because that tree gave life. And they already experienced sin. And there was no transformation. There was no cleansing. So God had to banish. The perfect world was gone. And he sets his plan into motion to redeem man from Satan through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus comes and he lives among, among, among us as man. He lays his deity completely down. Now, when you understand, he's not God when he comes to earth and he lays that deity down. Yes, he is the son of God, but he lays it down. So when he operates here on the earth, he's operating as a man. Because if he walked in power and authority as God, he couldn't redeem us back. He couldn't set us free. It had to be the shedding of pure blood, the shedding of a man's blood. And you know how Jesus' ministry got started it was the day that John the Baptist baptized him. He was 30, about 30. And I want to talk about this because this is very critical for you to understand. And it was actually a revelation that God gave me in writing this message. Jesus is being baptized. And what happens here? Because I can tell you, people thought Jesus was an ordinary person from Nazareth and nothing good was going to come out of Nazareth. And God took an ordinary person that everybody thought and carried out his plan to do an extraordinary plan to set man free 
from the bondage of sin. Jesus is baptized. He goes down into the water. Now, Jesus had nothing, nothing, absolute nothing to repent of. But he does it in obedience to the Father's plan to show us how to live. He goes down in the water, and when he comes up, this is what I believe happened. You know it, the scriptures say. The heavens literally opened and a dove swooshed down upon him. It was the Holy Spirit comes swoosh down on him. The power of the Holy Spirit. And God says, this is my son whom I am well pleased. This is my son who I love. I am well pleased. You know it. When God spoke, he stamped the identity on Jesus of who Jesus was. This is my son. And the Holy Spirit filled Jesus with power. But Jesus walked as man. We are God's children. We are created in the image of God. A son can act in authority on behalf of his father. Jesus is the son. God told him. And I don't know if the crowds on the shores heard God's voice, but John the Baptist did. And you know John the Baptist was the voice calling in the, in the wilderness, in the desert. He's out there and he's proclaiming Jesus. John heard it. I can tell you everybody else knew what John heard if they didn't. I believe this is how Jesus was able to do miracles. He had the authority of God, the almighty God to do so. And the power of the Holy Spirit operating in and through him. Jesus is fully man. He still keeps his integrity in check as man. He had to, for it was God's plan to work. It had to. Because if it didn't, God's plan wouldn't work. This is a perfect illustration for us. Jesus is man, just like us. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. The Holy Spirit lived inside of God, Jesus, the Son, the Son that was man. He lives inside of us, the Holy Spirit, now. God gives us authority because we are his sons and his daughters. Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit, and you know then he is. The Holy Spirit leads him into the desert, completely leads him into the desert. There we know that he's led there to be tempted by Satan. But you know what? Satan only, it only records three times that he's tempted. There may have been other times that he was tempted. I don't know. I only know what God's word says. But what happens in there, he, if he's there for 40 days, 40 nights, and he doesn't eat, he's praying. He's seeking the Father. And then the enemy comes, and he's tempted. And what does Jesus do? He say, it is written. How does he fight off Satan? It is written. It is written. Jesus used God's word, the very word of God, to fight off Satan. That is what we need to do, guys, when we are tempted. Because the scripture tells us to take every thought captive. How are we going to do that? 
I don't know about you, but I've sinned many of times. And I, you know, the enemy will be there talking and reminding you of your sin and what you did wrong. You got to take that thought captive. You got to take a thought. Use the word of God to fight off Satan. Jesus holds his ground. He doesn't waver an inch. We need to hold our ground. Don't waver. Every time Satan is tempted, he used the word. We need to use the word. Use the sword of the spirit, the word of God. It is the only weapon that we can use against Satan. It is the only way. The transformation process. We have to get alone with God. Jesus got alone with God multiple times. Multiple times. He'd get up early in the morning before I'm even out of bed. And he'd be, get alone with God. Let me use the illustration of a caterpillar. That might be something that you understand. I'm not even sure I understand as I study the caterpillar, but a caterpillar eats and eats and eats and it gets bigger and bigger and longer and longer. We need to eat the word of God. As the caterpillar is eating, it sheds its skin. We need to shed the skin of sin, of doubt, of unbelief. We need to shed that off. And then the caterpillar looks for a quiet place, a place that nobody can find him. And he usually will look for a leaf or a twig and then turn himself upside down. I, I have no idea how he does it, but he weaves a cocoon around him. We need to get alone and protect our time. We need to be alone with God and to be transformed into his word. And there's a metamorphosis when you're, that the caterpillar goes through. That whole process, we need to go through a transformation process because what happens to the caterpillar when it's done going through the metamorphosis, it bursts forth out of that cocoon and becomes a beautiful butterfly. We need to get alone with God and allow him to transform us into his likeness, into his image. And then we can come out and shine so brightly for Jesus. We don't have to worry about sin because God has already done his work inside of us. And we can walk as his sons and his daughters with authority and power and do what he has called us to do. He has called us to go into all the world and to preach the gospel. And he's also given back the ring of keys that he took back from Satan. And he has given those keys to us. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loosen on earth will be loosed in heaven. We have that power and authority to bind and loose life. So when I see somebody on the streets that needs God, that needs a miracle, that needs healing in their body. I am God's voice, peace today. You are God's voice. Study the word and become the word made flesh. Jesus is inside of you. He was the word made flesh. We need to become the word made flesh. 
and take the gospel to this dying world. But we have to do our part first, and that is to become transformed in the likeness of God and understand who we are. We are royalty. We are priesthood. We are the sons and daughters of God. Know who you are. My kids, my boys are here. Two of my kids here are here. They are my sons. They know. They have keys to my house. They know they can go in and they have access to that house. Anything that is in there. They belong. They have the authority to be there. They have the power to be there. God has given you the keys to heaven. You have the authority and the power to be there, to use anything in the Father's house. We are called to represent Jesus well, to be like him and to shine. We need to hear God's voice. We need to spend time with him in order to know how to respond. My kids know how I am going to respond in most every situation. They know. They've lived with me. They know. So if we spend time with God, we are going to know how he would respond in every single situation. We need to become like the Father, completely transformed into his image and become the word made flesh. I'm good. This time I'm going to turn it over to Pat for our song. Thank you, guys. You know what, Pat? I just want to, I hear the Lord say, I, I just want to pray and seal what I just spoke. Father God, I, I just pray for everybody that is hearing my voice right now, here in the congregation and online. Father God, I ask, Lord, that you would just pour your Holy Spirit out upon them. Father God, just pour your Holy Spirit out. Let them know who you are and who they are and what power and authority that they walk in as your son and your daughter, Father. Help us all to be more like you, to become your word made flesh and help us to reach out to this dying world that is so desperate in need of you, Father God. Help us to be your voice and to give the helping hand and to give hope to them and to speak the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well 